Hi, in the previous videos, we were discussing about the abnormalities of puparium and today we are going to see about the complication of third stage of labor and it of course it's an abnormality of puparium also and in that main abnormality so far we didn't see that we are going to see today that is postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage means any amount of bleeding from or into the genital tract following the birth of the baby up to the end of the puparium which adversely affects the general condition of the patient evidenced by rise in pulse rate and falling in BP is called postpartum hemorrhage. That is if the bleeding is occurring at any stage up to 6 weeks that is during the period of puparium after the delivery up to 6 weeks at any time if bleeding is occurring from or into the genital tract and if that bleeding is adversely affecting the condition of the mother that is known as the postpartum hemorrhage. And it is of two types primary postpartum hemorrhage and secondary postpartum hemorrhage. This primary postpartum hemorrhage again it is divided into third stage hemorrhage and true postpartum hemorrhage. If the bleeding occurs before the expulsion of the placenta before the delivery and of the placenta if the bleeding is occurring that is known as the third stage hemorrhage. We know that labor process is having three stages first second and third. First stage means it's up to the full dilatation of the cervix and second stage starts from the full dilatation of the cervix to the delivery of the baby and third stage starts from the delivery of the baby to the delivery of the placenta. So the main event which is happening in the third stage is placental delivery and if bleeding is occurring in this stage that is known as the third stage hemorrhage. And another thing is true postpartum hemorrhage that is bleeding occurs subsequent to the expulsion of the placenta that is after the expulsion of the placenta if the bleeding is occurring that is known as the true postpartum hemorrhage and the next classification already have told you that is secondary PPH that is secondary postpartum hemorrhage it is otherwise known as delayed postpartum hemorrhage or late postpartum hemorrhage. First let us see the causes of primary postpartum hemorrhage for remembering it easily we can remember it under four T's. The T stands for torn, tissue, trauma and thrombin. Torn, tissue, trauma, trauma and thrombin. Torn is the uterine attorney that is torn is the contraction or muscle torn of the uterine, uterine muscles. And tissue means it's the retention of products of conception that is fetal tissues or fetal membranes or placenta or placental lobes if something is remaining inside the uterus after the delivery of the placenta that is tissue. Trauma means any form of injury sometimes it may be a bleeding from the cesarean site or it may be bleeding from the episiotomy bone or it may be a bleeding from the cervical vaginal scar all those things are coming under the trauma and thrombin is the clotting abnormalities if the mother is having congenital clotting disorders for example if the mother is having one Willy Brandt's disease that is the deficiency of clotting protein or uh, if she is getting disseminated intravascular vascular coagulation during the time of delivery due to amniotic fluid embolism or if she is having dilutional co coagulocopathy that is due to the hemodilution if the amount of platelets or the clotting factors are not sufficient in the body in those cases she may get the bleeding. And first let us see about these things in detail already first T I told you that it is for torn that is torn of the uterine muscles that is if uterine atony is there if the uterus is not contracting effectively that will produce the postpartum hemorrhage and that is the 80 percentage cause for the postpartum hemorrhage and this you can see commonly in the case of multiparous woman or uh, if the uterus is over distended in the case of general anesthesia or uh, if perfusion to the myometrium is less in the case of prolonged labor. In all these cases we know that the capacity of the muscles will decrease due to the exhaustion in high parity and in the case of over distension and all muscle weakness will be there and even in the case of general anesthesia also due to the anesthetic effect the muscles may relax and in the case of prolonged labor also the muscles will get exhausted and if the uh, if poor, pure poor perfusion is there means that also will affect the capacity of the muscle 
and if following by the augmented labor that is before the natural onset of the labor if you are inducing the labor otherwise if uh, if you are giving oxytocin or other uh, oxytocin drugs or the drugs which are stimulating the uterine contraction if you are giving and if you are cut shorting or if you are reducing the duration of labor the uterus will not get sufficient time for uh, maintaining the retraction so that is for contracting effectively so that may leads to the bleeding uterine attorney in the previous labor already if the mother had a history of uterine attorney or poor uterine contractions during the previous labor or if the mother is having chorio amnionitis that is infection of the chorion chorion and amnion are the fetal membranes uh, the membranes which are covering the amniotic sac so if there is an infection of the chorion and amnion that may interfere with the capacity of the muscles and malformation of the uterus presence of uterine fibroid very rapid labor that is precipitate labor already we have seen in the previous abnormalities of labor if you are having any doubt about precipitate labor you can see the abnormal labor and mismanagement of the third stage of labor if some if someone is trying to remove the placenta before the separation of the placenta or if they are doing fundal pressure or if they are doing creeds management all those things leads to the improper contraction of the uterus and that leads to the bleeding and the next t was tissue that is already i told you that if bits of placenta or fetal membranes or if something is remaining inside the uterus after the delivery that leads to the profuse bleeding or that leads to the postpartum hemorrhage it can occur due to the constriction ring if constriction ring or hourglass constriction is there that is ring like spasmodic contraction annular spasm of the uh, contraction of the circular muscles of the uterus at a certain point usually between the upper and lower segment of the uterus so this ring like contraction will not allow the passage of the separated placenta down or out of the uterus that is one reason so due to that the placenta may remain inside the uterus incomplete separation of the placenta if the placenta is not separated properly already that we have seen in the placenta accreta all those conditions that video already it is there if you are having any doubt you can see that and retained placenta abnormally adherent placenta avulsed cotyledon succinctate lobe of placenta that is additional lobe or if a lobe is totally away from the entire lobe of the placenta that is known as the succinctate lobe this also already we have seen in the previous abnormalities of labor if placenta previa is there that is if the placenta is located in the lower segment of the uterus because when comparing to the upper segment of the uterus the lower segment is dilating the upper segment of the uterus is contracting and retracting while the lower segment of the uterus is dilating for the expulsion of the baby so if the placenta is in the lower segment effective contraction of the lower segment will not be there so there is a chance for bleeding from the blood vessels of the placenta blood vessels of the placenta means the blood vessels which are supplying to the placenta will get disrupted uh, an open wound will be creating inside the uterus when the placenta is getting separated and the bleeding will be there from that open wound and placental abruption that is premature separation of the placenta before the delivery of the baby and in the case of full bladder in all these things there is a chance for retention of placenta and that may produce the bleeding next cause is traumatic that is 20% of the postpartum hemorrhage is due to the trauma it may be sometimes it may be atonic and traumatic causes these two things may come together and the last one is coagulation disorders von willebrand's disease or if uh, by birth itself if the lady is having clotting factor deficiency or if she is having any type of coagulation disorders sometimes it may be acquired or sometimes it may be congenital so if anyway if she is having coagulation disorders that may leads to the profuse bleeding the other general factors that can contribute to the primary postpartum hemorrhage include antipartum hemorrhage that is already if the mother had a history of bleeding during the time of pregnancy her hemoglobin level will be less she will be anemic and her body will be weak so the muscles of the uterus uterine endometrium also will be weak so effective contraction of the muscles will not occur if she is having the history of postpartum hemorrhage or retained placenta in the previous delivery there is a chance for recurrence in the subsequent labor also and if mother if the mother is having anemia 
if anemia is there means naturally the weak muscles will be there if she is having ketoacidosis or if she is having hiv or aids in all these cases the body will be weak and that leads to the weakness of the muscles and that leads to the improper contraction of the uterine muscles now let us see the clinical features of this primary postpartum hemorrhage whether it is primary or secondary the clinical features will be almost same first one is an a visible vaginal bleeding bleeding will be there through the vagina and maternal collapse and the signs include signs of collapse include pal pallor rising pulse rate falling in blood pressure altered level of consciousness the lady will become restless and drowsy and if you are palpating the uterus the uterus will be enlarged and it will be boggy that is it won't be like a hard mass in the postpartum period actually the uterus will will be contracted effectively and it will be hard like a cricket ball but here actually it won't be contracted effectively so you will be feeling it as like boggy it won't be hard and the diagnosis include direct observation that is you can see the bleeding through the vagina if it is concealed bleeding if the bleeding is not visible through the vagina uh, you can see for the clinical features that is if the lady is getting fallen bp or if her blood uh, pulse rate is increasing if her respiratory rate become shallow if she become pale if she become restless in all these conditions you can suspect the hemorrhage even if the bleeding is not visible also and if it is a traumatic hemorrhage when you are palpating the uterus the uterus may be contracted because sometimes the bleeding may be from the cervix or maybe from the vagina and if it is an atonic hemorrhage if you are palpating the uterus the uterus will be relaxed it won't be in a contracted stage and the diagnostic investigations that you can perform include you should perform a thorough examination of the lower genital tract in order to exclude the possibility of the tear or bleeding you should it will help you to make out whether the bleeding is from a traumatic lesion or from other causes and you should take the complete blood count clotting time you should see you should take the blood for the cross matching and you should do the coagulation studies you should identify whether the mother is having any coagulation disorders or not and you should monitor the urinary output pulse and blood pressure should be monitored and it is better to monitor the central central venous pressure also and you should take the ecg and you should take attach the woman to the pulse oximetry now we can see the prevention how can we prevent this postpartum hemorrhage mainly the primary postpartum hemorrhage for preventing the postpartum hemorrhage you have to start the measures from the antenatal period itself because we have seen some of the factors or some of the causes for the postpartum hemorrhage are antenatal factors for example anemia uh, if the mother is having um, other severe diseases uh, if some, she is having uh, immunocompromised diseases all those things so we should start the preventive care from the antenatal period itself first one is improving the health status of the mother and her hemoglobin level should be more than 10 mg per 10 g per deciliter and you should screen the mother for the high risk conditions for example hiv aids all those things and blood grouping cross matching uh, coagulation disorders everything should be done during the antenatal period itself and if the mother is having any thromboembolytic disorders and if she is using heparin or low molecular heparin for this for the treatment of this condition it is better to discontinue it before the labor process starts and if the woman is woman is with lower level of increased risk of thromboembolism may be receiving aspirin sometimes if they are not having high risk instead of heparin we may be giving aspirin 75 mg daily in that cases it is before beginning the intrapartum prophylactically we should stop this aspirin also in the event if the woman is coming to the delivery with heparin therapy if she is having continuing the heparin and all of a sudden if she got the labor pain or through labor contractions we should stop the heparin immediately and for reducing the levels of or as an antidote for reducing the activity of the heparin in the body you can give protamine sulfate it will reverse the activity of the heparin more effectively more rapidly 
and you can slowly achieve the delivery of the baby in case if you are giving anesthesia an expert obstetric anesthetist should give the anesthesia otherwise that may leads to the uh, relaxation of the muscles of the uterus and active management of the third stage of labor also should be avoided in case if you are doing it should be done by an expert and after the delivery you can give the drugs which are producing uterine contraction usually we are giving methargin after the delivery of the shoulder uh, shoulder of the baby it will help for the effective contraction of the uterus and for the delivery of the placenta and for the other membranes you should not go for the pulling of the cord you should not do the kneading of the uterus or fiddling of the uterus and you should avoid creeds compression creeds compression means upper abdominally the people can hold the uterine fundus and sometimes they may squeeze the fundus by holding it in between the four fingers and the thumb it may help for the expulsion of the placenta but you should not do that that may leads to the premature separation of the placenta or sometimes a portion of the partial placenta may get expelled or separated and balance may remain inside we should not go for do such things and after the delivery of the placenta we should examine the placenta and membranes for the completeness and it is better to continue the oxytocin after at least for one hour after the delivery after the delivery you should check the genital tract for the presence of trauma and observe the patient for about 2 hours after the delivery for the postpartum hemorrhage or for the signs of hemorrhage and the immediate care of postpartum hemorrhage include communicate resist resuscitate monitor investigate and stop the bleeding management of third stage hemorrhage the principles of management of third stage hemorrhage includes first thing we should take measures to empty the uterus that is if bits of placenta or membranes or something is remaining inside the uterus you should take measures to remove it and if the mother is having severe bleeding you should replace the bed blood and if she is having shock we should manage the shock in order to affect in the case of traumatic bleeding you should maintain the hemostasis if the bleeding is from the placental side palpate the uterine fundus and massage the uterus this massaging may stimulate the uterine contraction and that may stop the bleeding otherwise you can or along with that you can give ergometrin 0.25 mg or methargin 0.2 mg intravenously usually we are giving intramuscularly but here you can give it give it intravenously and start dextrosaline drip and arrange for the blood transfusion if it is necessary and you should catheterize the bladder if the bladder is full because it may interfere with the uterine contractions full bladder may interfere with the effective contraction of the uterus so empty the bladder and if sedation is needed you can give morphine 15 mg intramuscularly and we can see the steps of manual removal of the placenta totally it includes seven steps that we are going to see now first one we should get written informed consent from the patient and at least two units of blood should be arranged these are the preliminary arrangements that we are supposed to do and actually the manual removal of the placenta we are doing under the general anesthesia and place the patient in a lithotomy position catheterize the bladder and empty the bladder separate the labia by the fingers of one hand and the other hand is introduced into the uterus in a cone shaped manner following the umbilical cord and made taut by the other hand margin of the placenta that is by using one hand you should hold the umbilical cord and the other hand should be uh, introduced into the vagina in a cone shaped manner following the direction of this umbilical cord and by following the direction of the umbilical cord you just locate the margin of the placenta and after locating the margin of the placenta apply counter pressure over the uterine fundus in order to steady the uterine fundus and to guide the movements of the fingers inside the uterine cavity and by using the slicing movement of the internal hand you can separate the placenta you can try for separate separating the placenta and if it is getting separated extract the placenta by applying traction over the cord or by using the other hand if the removal is difficult you can remove it and make it into pieces and you can remove the pieces of placenta and after that again you should give methargin 0.2 mg 
and you should inspect the cervical vaginal canal, canal for the presence of bleeding and the present placenta or pre, for, and for the presence of any injury or tear and after the delivery of the placenta you should observe the placenta for its completeness and after start 10 units of oxytocin in 500 ml of normal saline and it will help for the initiation of uterine contractions and prophylactically you should give antibiotics for next 12 to 24 hours to prevent the infection. So these are the things you can do for removing the placenta manually. Nothing is there, you are just introducing a hand into the vagina by manually by using the fingers of that hand you are trying to separate the placenta. In case if you failed, if you are not able to separate, what you can do means you can remove it into, uh, you can make it into pieces and you can remove that, those pieces. And if when you are doing it, if there is an hourglass constriction or if the placenta is adhered morbidly, it may be difficult for you to remove the placenta manually. The complications of this include there is a chance for hemorrhage or severe bleeding if bits of placenta or if the placenta is incompletely removed and due to the bleeding there is a chance for shock and when you are trying to remove it manually there is a chance for injury to the uterus and when you are doing this by manual examination and when you are introducing the hand into the vagina there is a chance for infection and there is a chance for inversion of the uterus and chance for sub-involution that is impaired involution is there chance for the risk for thromboembolitis and embolism. Next management of true postpartum hemorrhage. The principles of management include first you should diagnose the cause for the bleeding and you should take immediate and effective measures to control the bleeding and you should correct the hypovolemia. The management include you should the immediate measures include call for the help and you should you can give a head down position that will increase the venous return to the vital organs and that may increase the cardiac output you can start oxygen by mask you can start 8 liters of oxygen per minute and put large bore 15 gauge cannula for the patient it will be helpful if you want to start the blood transfusion and send the blood for the grouping and cross matching and arrange for two units of blood Infuse 2 liters of normal saline and colloids and other plasma substitutes. You use warming device and pressure cuff. Monitor the pulse, respiration and temperature and blood pressure every 4 hourly. And monitor the central venous pressure if possible. Urinary output also should be assessed. And assess what type of drug the patient is taking, dose, time, everything. The actual management include first palpate and feel the uterus and next massage the uterus the massaging of the uterus will stimulate the uterine contractions and explore the uterus under general anesthesia for the presence of clots and for the presence of exact location of the bleeding uterine massage and by manually compress the uterus insert one hand into the vagina and keep it just below the level of the uterine fundus and per abdominally apply the other hand and compress the uterus in between these two hands. This will stimulate the uterine contraction and it will help for preventing the bleeding. Other method is application of a tamponade. A balloon like structure you can ask like it is shown in the figure. See here you can see a balloon like structure this we will insert introduce through the vagina and after inserting inside the uterus you can just uh, inflate it and this will apply pressure over the walls of the uterus see it is in contact with the walls of the uterus and this will help for the prevention of the bleeding and the surgical methods include hysterectomy that is if the bleeding is severe and if you are not able to manage you can go for the removal of the uterus the other surgical measures include ligation of the uterine arteries or ligation of the ovarian and uterine artery anastomosis ligation and the of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery or wheeling press suture and hemostatic suturing that is cutting and ligating the arteries which are supplying to the uterus is a method otherwise the removal of the uterus itself that is also a method for controlling the uh, or these are the least last measures for controlling the bleeding and next secondary pph the causes for the secondary pph include retained bits of placenta or membranes 
infection and separation of the slough over a deep cervical vaginal laceration that is if an infection is there and when the slough is getting separated there is a chance for bleeding from that site endometritis or sub involution of the placental site if the uterus is not involuted or contracted effectively that may produce a bleeding withdrawal bleeding following estrogen therapy uh, and suppression of for the suppression of lactation that is for suppressing the breastfeeding if the lady is using estrogen when she is stopping the estrogen there is a chance for bleeding the other causes include chorion epithelioma carcinoma of the cervix infected fibroid and fibroid polyp in these cancerous lesions or in the polyps also there is a chance for bleeding the diagnosis include usually the bleeding will be bright red if natural bleeding means it won't be bright red it will be dark brown in color if bright red bleeding is there you should suspect the secondary pph and you should see for the evidences of anemia and you should assess for the evidences of sepsis or infection and in case if you are observing fresh bleeding you should do an internal examination and you should assess for the infection chances of infection that is if you are assessing the lochia we know that the vaginal discharges for the first fortnight after delivery is known as lochia and if it is having an offensive smell or if it is candy both these conditions shows or suggest the infection and sub involution of the uterus also should be assessed and by the ultrasonography you can identify whether bits of placenta are remaining inside the uterus or inside the uterine cavity for confirming that you can perform the ultrasonography and the management include first you just assess the amount of blood loss and if it is needed you just take measures to replace the amount of blood blood which is which has loss and identify the exact cause for the bleeding and the management is based on the cause of the bleeding and in all these cases you should give the supportive therapy you should start blood transfusion transfusion if necessary injection at ergometrin 0.5 mg intramuscularly can be given if the bleeding is from the uterus you should start antibiotics because sometimes it may be due to the sepsis you should start antibiotics and for the conservative management if the bleeding is slight and if it is not producing any deviation in the health status of the mother you just wait for 24 hours and watch and if there is no problem you can sometimes automatically within 24 hours it may get stopped in that case active management is not needed the active treatment include if uh, retained bits of placenta or membranes are there means you should remove it for that you can explore the uterus under the general anesthesia and the products should be can be removed by the ovum forceps and gentle curettage also can be done by using the flushing curette after removing the products give ergometrin 0.5 mg intramuscularly if bleeding is from the sloughing of the wound or from the cervical vaginal canal control it by suturing of the of that wound and start antibiotics also the complications of this include shock collapse and disseminated intravascular coagulation the nursing management of this primary pph and secondary postpartum hemorrhage include the nursing first we should formulate the nursing diagnosis the common nursing diagnosis that you can write include deficiency of fluid volume fear and anxiety pain risk of complications interrupted breastfeeding risk for impaired parenting inter interrupted family process these are the common nursing diagnosis you can write the nursing interventions you should formulate accordingly so thank you for watching this video about the postpartum hemorrhage soon we will be meeting with the next video till that bye